without further ado, we're going to jump right into our first uh, educational presentation. Um, so I'm honored to be able to introduce uh, to you today Dr. Hubert Lim. Uh, he is a passionate and uh, very experienced uh, scientist, um, and I've had the opportunity to talk with him several times. Um, he has a real talent for explaining his research, uh, which is really complicated uh, stuff, brain stuff, which is hard for us to wrap our brains around, but he is able to explain it in a way that makes it really understandable. So we're fortunate to have him here today. He'll actually be speaking today and tomorrow on two different subjects. Um, uh, Dr. Lim is a professor in the biomedical engineering and otolaryngology departments at the University of Minnesota uh, and was hired as an Institute for Translational Neuroscience Scholar. He's also the Endowed Lions Professor in Otolaryngology and co-director for the Center for Neural Engineering. He completed a BSc in Bioengineering at UC San Diego, followed by a dual master's in um, Biomedical Engineering and Electrical Engineering in Computer Science. Then, as if that weren't enough, a PhD in Biomedical Engineering at the University of Michigan, so he knows what he's doing. Um, at the University of Minnesota, his lab's research focuses on neural engineering, uh, neuromodulation techniques, sensory neuroscience, neuroplasticity, and neuroimmune physiology with the aim of developing new stimulation treatments for hearing disorders, pain, and uh, inflammatory conditions. Um, he does this in collaboration with multiple clinicians and companies, including several who are presenting today or who are uh, exhibiting today, including cochlear, Starkey, and Neuromod devices. Uh, Dr. Lim's been the recipient of many awards, including the Peter and Patricia Gruber International Research Award in Neuroscience from the Society of Neuroscience, um, and also from the Institute for Engineering and Medicine. He received the Faculty Career Development Award and Outstanding Service Award. Um, outside of his academic activities, he's currently involved with two startups, uh, serving as the Chief Scientific Officer of both Neuromod Devices and Second Wave uh, Systems. So we're excited to hear what he has to present for us today. Please let me introduce Dr. Hubert Lim. Uh, well, thank you, Troy. That's very, very generous. A lot of pressure <laughs> to make sure everybody understands all the content. And um, this is my first time uh, at this uh, uh, workshop course series. Uh, so it's nice to be here in person. And I do appreciate the organizers uh, for inviting me here to share uh, on this topic of bimodal neuromodulation. Tomorrow will be on ultrasound hearing technology, a little bit more futuristic. Uh, but hopefully, again, uh, I can be able to explain the difficult concepts to you all. Uh, so <clears throat> the topic today is bimodal neuromodulation for tinnitus. Uh, some of you may ha heard about it or may have not. Uh, just in a simple form, bimodal is just two inputs. It could be many different inputs. Uh, for today's talk, it's going to be sound combined with electrical stimulation of the body. And the idea is to alter uh, plasticity or, or uh, brain activity to then drive uh, improvements in tinnitus uh, symptoms. And since I'm fortunate today, because we have enough time, a lot of times I'm trying to cram this into about 10 minutes or 15 minutes. Uh, I'm able to really dive into more of the science today, uh, some schematics and video uh, or cartoons, uh, and then some clinical data, which I uh, have found to be quite encouraging across different groups. And then of course, uh, questions at the end. So the concept of bimodal neuromodulation and, and the, the concept and rationale behind it. Uh, the idea is that it would be nice to have a device that could be uh, more accessible, easy to use, like a sound device, um, but at the same time, it could provide greater and or longer improvements in the tinnitus symptoms, um, ideally to shut down the sound, but as we know with CBT, even being able to reduce the symptoms or awareness or the botherness of the sound percept, the tinnitus percept, uh, without necessarily, you know, per se, that sound is uh, dropping down, that could be quite beneficial for these patients. But if you want to try to figure out the best of both worlds, then we got to think about how you could, in a more convenient device, drive these changes in the brain to be more long-term, more effective, as you would with these psychotherapy approaches. And so that's where we have to go back to the brain. So if you think about the brain here, this is a very simplified view. And I don't know if I have a laser pointer, probably not. Uh, it's, it's actually okay, I could probably just talk it out maybe. <laughs> so this is a brain and you have 
sound that comes in through the ear. It's gonna, of course, vibrate the middle ear bones, activate the cochlea, cochlear fluids, vibrations, and activate the hair cells. And then the activity is going to go along the auditory nerve to the brainstem. It's gonna move up to the midbrain and fear colliculus, thalamus, all the way up to auditory cortex. And that's where the perception happens. Now, there are different camps, but uh, majority I do feel uh, that we believe tinnitus in a lot of individuals is associated with some form of hearing loss. And even though it wasn't able to be measured, we all know about hidden hearing loss and other uh, uh, sub-measured um, outcomes uh, for, for hearing loss. But if you think about that there is hearing loss in most of these tinnitus patients, Oh, this works too. Okay, great. So if you think about hearing loss here and you have some lack of input into the auditory system, well, the good news is, is the body, as we all know, does a very good job in most cases trying to adapt and compensate. And thank goodness it does because we want our body to help us when things go awry and we could try to recover back. So what the brain does, and this is very simplified. I mean, there's different models and different hypotheses and proposed mechanisms and so forth, but just in a very simple sense, again, the brain will try to increase the gain of the brain to hear the sound. Now, arrows point up, could be as if activity is going up, but it's more complicated than that. I don't wanna get into it, but you, know, you could have the brain network neurons communicating in a more closer synergistic way. Uh, Actually, activity could be going down and that could be a gain increase. I mean, there's just a lot of ways that neurons could be coding, but just descriptively, it's trying to increase the gain somehow. However, the neurons or cells are you know, working together to make that happen. And that's fine, except that in some cases, the brain overcompensates and it leads to this hyperactivity, hypersynchrony or abnormal coding in the brain that then's causing the tinnitus. So we do know sound can be delivered, and that was you know, one of the earlier slides, to interact with this network and mass the tinnitus. You could also sound in some individuals, they'll report that there'll be residual effects where the sound is altered or suppressed and it's actually can be manageable, comfortable. And there could be some even alterations short term potentially with sound. But what if you could actually get that sound effect to be amplified even more? So what if you could think of it as like a super sound treatment or super enhanced therapy? And the idea then is that maybe you could play sound, but then use some kind of reinforcer to do whatever sound is trying to do because it's already in the auditory system and it's already interacting with the tinnitus percept because we know we could mask or interact with the tinnitus percept. Then you use the somatosensory or non-auditory pathway, trigeminal nerve, vagus nerve. There's many different potent pathways, nerves that interface with not only the auditory system, but many of the brain regions that are involved with awareness, plasticity, and learning. And so if you could use those inputs, then maybe you could have kind of like a super auditory therapy, right? And then of course, the idea is over time, uh, not too long because we were trying to do this in a faster way, more accelerated way, in a convenient way than CBT, you would be able to reduce down the tinnitus. So this is what I, I think is kind of fun to go into more of the science without having a 15 minute talk. Um, and I want to take you along the journey of kind of thinking through and what I was doing when I was starting this research. Uh, you know, I, I got in, I lived in Germany for four, four years doing my postdoc there in Hanover, Germany, and I got into tinnitus. But when I came to University of Minnesota in 2009, uh, my goal was to kind of try to frame this and figure out in a more systematic way how you could create such a super auditory therapy approach, right? And there's some things that have to exist or happen to, you know, potentially make this work. And so I just listed a few here. I mean, this is still, again, simplified. But if you think about bimodal neuromodulation and you know, we would want to kind of think of how this might actually shift the coding in the brain to treat tinnitus, there's some things that you, know, you would like to see or have observed that would build confidence that this could potentially work. Um, on the first scale there, 
um, you know, you would want to see is there kind of any behavioral evidence that such kind of bimodal stimulation alters perception or preference for, uh, in our case, you know, sound features. And fortunately, over 100 years ago, uh, people all know the Pavlov dog, uh, you know, with the bell, and I'll get into that a little bit. Um, that is quite convincing evidence that you can train uh, animals and humans to become more sensitive to certain sounds that they previously viewed as meaningless, right, like a bell. Um, but then that's great, the behavior happens, but also then in the brain, are there actually neurons and cells and circuitry that are shifting or changing in a way that are consistent with what we would think should be happening by doing this bimodal stimulation. And fortunately in the auditory field, it, it wasn't you know, my work, but there was quite a number for four decades, more than four decades of individuals uh, like Dr. Weinberger and Dr. Su no, uh, Suga uh, and others who were basically recording from auditory neurons. I mean, literally they, all these researchers recorded from everywhere along the auditory pathway and they are able to show using bimodal paradigms that they could shift tuning properties and all sorts of um, coding properties in the auditory system uh, in systematic ways by playing certain types of sounds and reinforcing it in different ways uh, using bimodal paradigm. And then finally, the third one is where I came into the picture uh, in 2009, is that um, how could we tap into this bimodal stimulation in a systematic way in a non-invasive way, uh, what pathways could be accessed? And there had there were some questions about, yes, the sound goes there, but for example, what body region, is there certain body regions that project more predominantly to the auditory system that we could tap into? And is there certain parameters uh, and functional connections that would enable that, that would justify those projections? And that's where some of my research uh, happened from 2009 to 2015 period. So these are the three things I'm gonna jump into uh, with all of you today. So Pavlov's dog, uh, this, I don't have to explain it to many of you, you all know, uh, this is a cute little dog here, uh, just wanting food. Uh, and uh, when the food comes over, uh, the animal will salivate. But what's interesting is that you could ring a bell, which is meaningless and the dog could not care. But if you then ring the bell, every time you bring the food, then you could actually have the dog salivate to the bell, even when there's no food. And it's interesting, uh, actually this, this series of studies that was published, uh, the bell wasn't the only thing they used. They used all, all sorts of things, different sounds. They used light. Um, they used uh, various other kind of sensory inputs. But the point, and, and also it didn't have to be exactly timed. Even the dog became, would salivate to the hearing of the footsteps coming up the stairs. And so that was, you know, 10 seconds delayed. So when you think about this then, the dog has become more sensitive to that bell sound because of this reinforcement signal, which is food. But the reinforcement signal doesn't have to be just food. It could be other inputs. And that's the question, big question mark, what other inputs? Kind of jumping ahead, just to give a little bit more perspective, you know, what does this have to do with tinnitus? Well, you could imagine if the dog had tinnitus or has tinnitus and is hearing, I don't know, maybe the tinnitus is, well, let's say 10 kilohertz for the dog, uh, then you could play sounds to the dog that are five kilohertz and provide food or provide reinforcer. And then the dog really cares about the other five kilohertz sound. And if you did it enough, potentially the tension, the awareness and the cells there could shift their a focus away from the 10 kilohertz more aware and sensitive to the five killers. Now you don't want to cause five kilohertz tinnitus. So you don't want to just do five killers over and over again, but you would want to do different frequencies. So that's just a hint to where we're going to be moving along in the storyline. Okay, so now let's jump into some neuroscience data, right? Um, behavior is great, but what about physiology, neurophysiology, brain patterns? Is this really changing in any systematic way that makes sense? Or is it just somehow the brain is a big black box and some magical thing happened and then the dog and this Pavlonian conditioning happens? I love these studies. I mean, these were done by Dr. Wein, late Dr. Weinberger from UC Irvine, but there are multiple studies uh, that are similar to this. And just to orient you, uh, in these studies, you know, in, in the more simplest ones I'm showing here, more straightforward, um, they'll take these electrodes, right? These electrodes that can be put into the brain and you can actually record 
uh, individual or multiple cells, brain cells, neurons. And this particular, particular experiment was done in the primary auditory cortex of guinea pigs. And they were able to place electrodes and just like the cochlea, which is frequency organized or tonotopically organized, they were able to place you know, electrodes if they wanted to in different frequency regions. In this case, they placed the electrode in the uh, two point, uh, in the about one kilohertz region of the primary auditory cortex. And when they have that electrode there, then what they'll do is they'll present different tones. And so if you could see, they present, they present some low frequencies, a few hundred Hertz. And the Y axis, you know, don't have to worry too much. Just think of it as amount of activity for this cell, this neuron that they're recording in the primary auditory cortex. So up means the activity just firing more. It likes that sound, right? So you have a few hundred Hertz and this cell is like, I could care less. I don't really care about 200 Hertz, 300 Hertz. And then you get to 800 Hertz and then one kilohertz. And it's like, wow, I love that sound, right? So it's firing away. And then you keep going to two kilohertz to 10 kilohertz. And it's like, I really don't care, right? So this neuron we say is tuned to about 800 Hertz, one kilohertz. This is the cool part. So what Dr. Weinberg and his lab did then is they took this animal and they, in this case, electrically st stimulated the leg or, or the body. And they paired the electrical stimulation with a new tone. And in this case, 2.5 kilohertz. And they paired it just 30 times, right? This is how potent it is. They just did it 30 times. And then after they recorded from that neuron again, and what you see is that the neuron overall the activity is a little bit elevated. So we got the neuron going, right? It's, it's a little bit more excited. But the thing is, is that as you move along now, it's not tuned anymore to 800 Hertz. It actually shifted its sensitivity to be tuned to what? The 2.5 kilohertz that we paired it with, right? And then as you go higher, it drops back down. It doesn't care about those higher frequencies. And so two things to observe from this plot. One is that you can shift systematically cells in your brain to be more sensitive to different tones to different sounds. And it's not just frequencies. Uh, Dr. Suga and a lot of other colleagues, they did everything you could think of from amplitude modulation, frequency modulation, duration tuning, all these sorts of features. You can make your brain by doing this pairing shift its coding properties, right? The second thing to look at is there is some kind of homeostasis, right? Because, and, and this makes sense. I mean, the brain, uh, some of you may know, has a lot of inhibitory networks and it actually shuts things down from getting too hyperactive because I've done this before. If you electrically stimulate too much in the cortex, you can actually cause hyperactivity into seizures. And so this is where, you know, people have seen it with, you know, visual prosthetics back in the day, they can induce seizures by driving too much activity in the brain, bypassing that break that you have in your brain, the inhibitory break. So in essence, not everything could be lit up all the time. So there's gotta be some homeostasis. And what you end up having is here, this curve, if you look at 800 Hertz, you actually have a decrease in activity where it used to be, right? So it's almost like it shifted. You've got some more sensitivity, but this neuron where it was sensitive to before has kind of dampened caring about those other frequencies that it loved so much before, right? And that's important because and kind of hinting back, you know, forward for tinnitus, you know, why does this even matter to tinnitus? And it's a little more complicated than this, but if this neuron was somehow you could think of part of a, a, a group, right, a network, that was coding for tinnitus and it sound came in, it exacerbated the tinnitus or it itself was focusing somehow on some network to that tinnitus sound and you played a different sound and got it to shift its coding property. It cannot still be the same way it was before, can't have two identities, right? So it's got a new identity and the previous one, it's gonna be altered somehow. And hopefully in that new identity, the old identity of caring about the tinnitus has gone down, right? Through homeostasis. Make sense? Okay. All right, so I just wanna show another example because it's not just that the neurons activity will be adjusted, right? That it will be going up or down, but populations of cells are changing in their collectiveness, right? And this paper, uh, also I love this paper, it was done by Dr. Michael Kilgard's group at UT Dallas. 
Uh, he had some seminal work earlier on. Uh, they were trying to actually develop vagus nerve implant for tinnitus. Some of you may have known that. Um, similar experiment in rats this time, <clears throat> and they're recording from many cells in the primary auditory cortex, lots of cells, right? Uh, and if you look at the x-axis here, there are different frequencies and the different frequencies just tell you that they recorded from a lot of neurons that like one to two kilohertz, right? Because I showed you before, you can tune a neuron so you could tell what sounds a certain neuron likes. So they are able to find all the neurons that like one to two kilohertz, all the neurons that like three to four, all the neurons that like middle and high frequencies. And in the control, these are just animals that nothing happened. You could see what percentage of the cells that they're able to map in the primary auditory cortex, what percentage of them like those frequencies. So let's say they recorded from a thousand cells from the primary auditory cortex, 20% like one to two kilohertz, 15% like four to five kilohertz, right? So this is basically what they did. They're just trying to figure out the proportion of cells in the primary auditory cortex that like different frequencies. Well, then what they did, similar to what you saw before, is that they had a vagus nerve implant in this case. So another reinforcer, it's a different kind of reinforcer. They had a vagus nerve implant in the rat and they paired synchronized you know, bimodal stimulation with a specific tone. And in this case, it was nine kilohertz, right? And they presented that, and this one's more intense. They did, uh, if I look here, 6,000 trials, right? 300 times per day over 20 days. So the other one was 30 trials just in a setting, but this is over 20 days. <clears throat> and what happens? Well, if you look, Again, like you saw on that previous slide, but now instead of talking about amount of activity of a GIN cell, we're talking about populations of cells. You see that this here peak has shown up at the frequency that they were pairing to. And same thing here, if they pair it to a different frequency, in this case, 19 kilohertz, you do the same thing. So you can do it with different frequencies and you could just keep sh shifting these populations of cells all over the place. Again, what you see is that there's this homeostasis happening because there's, I mean, you can't have, it makes sense because you can't have like more neurons than you started off with, because that'd be kind of, well, that'd be amazing, but you know, it can't really happen in this context. So you have some homeostasis again. So there's homeostasis and amount of activity you can have, and just by physics and limitations of number of neurons, you can't just start recreating neurons. You're going to have to have some shifts in the network, right? But again, if we all want to believe this new identity versus old identity, and you have these networks shifting. However, that tinnitus was being coded, that tinnitus network is struggling now because you've just keep changing not only the activity of cells, but you're changing the networks that represent that tinnitus. So eventually you would hope that that would collapse the tinnitus percept, okay? All right. So we've got through behavioral aspect and we've got through physiological aspect. Now, how in the heck are we going to implement this and where do we start? What do we do? You know, which body regions? And that's where I was at in 2009. I was trying to think to myself, okay, there's been a lot of amazing research before me showing that all these body regions project to the auditory system. This is just, you know, probably 10%, 5% of the literature, but you have sound coming up the auditory system through the different pathways and all these body regions project to the different, not directly, but through polysynaptic pathways, uh, they converge into these different auditory regions. So I don't know where to start. So what I did was I decided I'm gonna do my own experiments and I'm gonna stimulate everywhere in, in the guinea pig. And I'm just gonna try to figure out what body regions combined with which sounds can alter activity. And I focused on two regions because I could put electrodes uh, my PhD was focusing here to make in what was called an auditory midbrain implant. It's a hearing prosthetic in the inferior colliculus. So I had a lot of experience there. And then auditory cortex, I do a lot of research there. So I, and perception you would assume is happening there. So we recorded from both of these places simultaneously because we could put these multi-site electrode arrays, dense electrode arrays in both places and record simultaneously. And we did a lot of experiments and this was all published and I'm not gonna get into it due to time, but what we found then was that uh, all the regions actually worked, not surprising, because as I mentioned before, there's many ways you can reinforce, but there were some that were stronger than others. And it just happened that electrical stimulation of the ear was sound and electrical stimulation of the tongue. The ear made sense to me. The tongue was a bit surprising, but we then in this paper in the conclusion said tongue is a very 
good target, potential target to look at. Um, I was not working with Neuromod at the time, and this is just full transparency. Um, and actually, you know, I was kind of observing that company and those other companies uh, going on in other efforts like Dr. Susan Shore's effort. Um, but they were already doing tongue stimulation with sound. You know, they're in early stages. Um, so I published that. And it was because that paper that the CEO ended up contacting me. And that's how we all, um, you know, got initiated our relationship. Um, but I couldn't pursue the tongue stimulation. It was too difficult because you need a certain type of electrode that can be placed in the mouth. Um, so my lab, we basically focused in on electrical stim of the ear and sound. And there were some things that I also, also talked to Dr. Rich Tyler about. And as some of you may have saw in his recent Tindis conference, uh, he was working with Bose and they had done electrical stim of the ear with sound and found some encouraging results. So that's all you know, pointing in the, in the right direction. And then tongue, I ended up obviously collaborating with Neuromod devices. And just to dive a little bit further, um, it's not just input of the body and convergence of sound you know, into the brain auditory system, um, there are other uh, much more potent pathways that are enabling plasticity. And so if you look here, this is just, again, one pathway, simplified one. But if you do bimodal, you would have sound through the ear going to the auditory system. <clears throat> you would have your, in this case, tongue stimulation, but it could be electrical ear or other body regions. In this case, tongue actually goes to trigeminal nerve, not only to the brain stem regions, but it'll also then project to the sending reticular activating system. Uh, this is involved with so many functions in your brain, alertness, awakeness, uh, also regions connected to it related to plasticity and learning. And you can imagine that it sets, sets off a cascade of reinforcement. So there's a lot that's going on here. And I'm not saying we understand this even close to, but there are different components that are contributing to the plasticity effects. Okay. So just to summarize before I get into the cartoon and then jump into some clinical data, uh, I hope I just kind of help you understand that there is, you know, if you think about bimodal stimulation, why would this even potentially work or have a chance? Um, there is behavioral evidence that you can shift things in a meaningful way um, with sounds that were meaningless, right? By doing paired stim. There's physiological evidence. People have done lots of recordings in the brain to show how you could systematically shift sensitivity of the brain to certain sounds doing bimodal stimulation. And then finally, the last bit, which is my contribution to this series is that um, there are certain body regions and certain ways that you could stimulate to uh, drive what we believe, or I believe to be a greater amount of plasticity in the brain, which uh, I'm hypothesizing is relevant for tinnitus treatment because obviously, you know, those are in animals and what happens in tinnitus patients is another story. You have to kind of confirm it in clinical trials. So look at, let's look at the cartoon just to finally put it all together um, and how to kind of view this. And this is uh, very, very simplified. Um, this is your brain and this is your brain on drugs. No, <laughs> so if, you, if you're old enough, you get it. Uh, <laughs> but really this is your brain and this is your brain with tinnitus, right? And you have the triangles that represent the tinnitus percept. Now, I'm not saying this is your auditory cortex. I'm not saying, you know, it's a certain brain region or one region, just to keep it a bit abstract, because to be honest, even though we've come a long way, we still don't fully know where tinnitus is being coded and how it's being coded. It's, it's very complicated and it can vary from uh, different subgroups of individuals. So you have triangles that represent the tinnitus and it's there. It's present, you hear it, right? Okay, well, you can play sound and sound can do different things. I mean, it can, if you do a certain frequency sound, it's gonna activate some other cells. I mean, for simplicity, I didn't have them overlap, but you know, you could play some different sounds and this might be more analogous to masking because now you can't really just focus or hear the tinnitus because you have this other sound there. Um, and if you play different sound, it also could be masking. One could be potentially better than the other. After you turn it off, then the tinnitus is still there. Now, I know this is a bit simplified because there is some residual effects to sound. We know that. Uh, some of my colleagues like Alex um, over at Newcom, uh, you know, they've shown some nice residual effects that you can cause with sound. Uh, but just for simplicity, I mean, you know, for, for purpose of this talk, uh, we're simplifying that the sound turns off and, and the tinnitus is still there. So how do we make like a super sound therapy effect, right? Well, this is where bimodal comes in. <clears throat> And if you think about the science 
uh, data and plots I showed you earlier. So keeping that in mind, you have your brain, here's a tinnitus cells, and you then basically do bimodal stimulation, sound with electrical stimulation of the tongue in this case. I mean, it could be any body region. Uh, those, you know, lightning symbols means electrical, and then you have the sound bimodal. And what's going to happen? Can anyone guess? You have some residual effect, right? It's going to stick around. But what will happen to the tinnitus cells, we think? It'll get less. Yes. Okay. So the lecture did work in the first half of this talk. <laughs> so you have the brain, and you basically then have some residual effects coming in, and the tinnitus cells would somewhat dilute, right? Okay. Well, looking good. So why don't we just keep on going? But again, I wouldn't want to just do the same tone over and over again, because the hypothesis would be that you might induce a different kind of tinnitus, right? So then you take the brain again and you present a different tone and you pair it again and you do the same thing. And as you all said before, well, it's starting to get a little bit more diverse here, right? You're gonna cause other cells to become more sensitive and then you're gonna dilute the triangle even more, right? Because of homeostasis. And then you just go to town. You basically do all sorts of different sounds. And the idea then is that you basically kind of just normalize, dilute it. Now, the hypothesis is that you might actually have caused a little bit more sensitivity to sound overall, right? So that would be the hypothesis. So this is the concept, right? Now, this is a two-decade research plan of my lab to confirm all these little pieces, um, but this is what I'm thinking in terms of, you know, the proposed mechanism, how this works. 